Good morning, everyone. With great honor and pleasure, here Dr. K. M. Sumati, Assistant Professor of English, welcomes you all for the first day of the National Virtual Seminar Series organized by the Department of English on eco criticism with reference to Orwell, Tarhawk, and Ruskin Bond. Eco criticism investigates the relation between humans and the natural world in literature. It deals with how environmental issues, cultural issues concerning the environmental and attitudes towards nature are presented and analyzed. One of the main goals in eco-criticism is to study how individuals in society behave and react in relationship, relation to nature and ecological aspects. This form of criticism has gained a lot of attention during recent years due to higher social emphasis on environmental destruction and increased technology. It is hence a fresh way of analyzing and interpreting literary text, which brings new dimensions to the field of literary and theoretical study. Eco-criticism is an intentionally broad approach that is known by a number of other designations includes green studies, maybe green cultural studies, eco-poetics, and environmental literacy criticism. With this short intro, I'm extremely delighted in welcoming our diligent, humble, and efficient dear mom, Dr. G.S. Angelin, head of the Department of English, to deliver welcome address and introduce the chief guest. Ma'am, please come. Distinguished dignitaries, learned professors, enthusiastic participants from various institutions and from our own college, I wish you all a very good morning. The Department of English has organized a series of national level virtual seminars for the benefit of students, scholars, and teachers. It is a five day oh, program. No, sir. Ah, and resource persons from different parts of the nation who will give lectures to enlighten the participants in different areas of specialization. I'm sure these sessions will help you in deepening and widening your intellectual experience. Today is the first day of the series, and I'm happy to welcome you all. First of all, I would like to welcome our principal, Dr. V. Anuradha, who is a source of encouragement in all her activities. With her humanitarian and friendly approach, she works wonders. She has kindly consented to preside over today's webinar and give a presidential address. She will join us a little later. I welcome you wholeheartedly, madam. It is a proud privilege bestowed upon me to welcome our resource person, Professor Atmaram Gangane, Professor and Head of the Department of English and Research Center, Yano Pasak, Sikshan Mandal's College of Arts, Commerce and Science, Prabhani, Maharashtra. He has got 30 years of teaching experience and has delivered lectures in Singapore, London, and Thailand. He has participated in 90 conferences, seminars, and workshops, and has published 50 research papers. He has guided 10 PhD scholars and 6 MPhil scholars. I render you a respectable welcome, sir. Thank you. My hearty Thank you welcome. Very much. My hearty Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My hearty welcome to our IQAC coordinator, Dr. K. M. Sumadhi, Department of English. My amiable welcome to the teaching fraternity. Last but not the least, I welcome the students, scholars, and teachers whose participation is useful to them and encouraging to the organizers. My warm welcome to you. Once again, I welcome you one and all. Thank you.
Sumati, that's the game, Sumati. Sorry, got a call. <coughs> Oh, sorry, I got a call from our principal. No? Shall we proceed, ma'am? Hello. Yes, we can proceed. I have completed ah, my welcome address. Ah, yes, ma'am. Just now I got a call from our principal, ma'am. She has asked us to proceed, ma'am. So that's okay. why I got this. Um, okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. A dream does not become reality through magic. It takes sweat, determination, and hard work. May I invite a determined, wise, protective, eminent personality, Professor Dr. Atmaram Gangane, Professor and Head of Department of English and Research Center, Yano Pasam, Shikshan Mandal's College of Arts, Commerce, and Science. <laughs> To tell you a special lecture on eco criticism with reference to Arwell, Tahak, and Raskin Bond. So please, sir, please join us. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. okay. Uh, Yami Muthai Government Arts College for Women, Dindigul, organized a national virtual seminar series and invited me to deliver a talk. So in the very commencement, I thank you for invitation. Dr. Angelin, the chief guest of the national seminar and convener also. Dr. V. Anuradha, honorable principal. Dr. Parvata, Dr. K. M. Sumati, who is constantly busy in communicating all the matters of the seminar and very promptly attended the queries. And dear participants, in the very commencement of uh, my talk, uh, I wanted to be very clear and transparent that eco-criticism is not my area of specialization, but I wanted to share my views in relation to Orwell, Starhawk, and Ruskin Bond. Before I directly go to eco-criticism, I would like to flash a light on deep ecology, which is a very recent addition to the branch of ecological philosophy, which developed effectively as a political and ethical moment of environmentalism about protection and at the same time conservation of nature. When we think of deep ecology, naturally we are forced by the circumstances to think of shallow ecology movement, which has an anthropocentric and instrumental approach towards the preservation of nature. It believes that Environmental conservation should only be practiced to the extent that it meets human welfare, human needs. Of course, the purpose of nature is to serve humans. Of course, it is thought many a time because the humans are the only life forms of value and superior to all other forms of lives. There is always the first preference to the fulfillment of the human's needs. And only if these needs are hampered by the destruction of the environment, then and then only it becomes a matter of concern. Otherwise, not. We do not pay heed to the danger made to nature. On the contrary, biocentric, ecocentric approach of deep ecology suggests that all the life forms have their individual intrinsic value and equal rights as nobody is a master of anybody. It puts forward earth first approach where earth becomes the center and all other forms of life 
आर एट द पेरिफरी आरने नेस डिसाइफर्स हाउ डीप इकोलॉजी डिफर्स फ्रॉम इकोलॉजी द वर्ड इकोलॉजी रेफर्स टू साइंस ऑफ बायोलॉजी which actually deals with the study of living things and their interaction with each other and their surroundings basically ecological science with a view concerns only with facts and logic and consequently fails to answer ethical questions and fundamental philosophical queries about how man has to live how he has to survive so it is a limited science why because it is not uh, related to deep questioning such as why and how and what are the deep commitments right down to fundamental root causes of deterioration of nature again the aim of deep ecology is to look after the development of ecological wisdom by focusing on deep experience deep questioning and the, and these deep questionings constitute a reciprocal and a kind of uh, an interconnected system hence this moment is so far eco philosophical rather just being an ecological it gives a rise to the idea of ecological equilibrium with the entire ecosystem in persistence of the identical stratum deep ecology takes in metaphysical ontological and ethical cross examination ethics of of course deep ecology convinces the need of biocentric equality where self realization leads to substitute and subside the ego to curtail the greed to reinforce nature the ecologists have revealed with their focus on the conditions of self realizations rather than personal identity this self appraisal will establish a harmony with the cosmos on one hand and by way of minimizing or diminishing their material desires and on the other hand biocentric approach will adhere to all the living beings and consequently the non human nature will have an equal intrinsic value in cosmic sphere eco criticism the study of nature as someone has recently of course revealed the study of nature as represented in literature is what that has been the playground for people concerned with this new moment in literary theories constant ignorance of human beings towards nature due to the demand of the world fails to naturally realize that nature offers so much to human but man gives nothing in return to the nature does the to understand nature return to nature will be the only mechanism through which one can fully become very close and intimate with nature cheryl glott felt the first professor of environment and literary studies in her the eco criticism reader landmarks in literary ecology has of course very clearly defined eco criticism as the study of the relationship between literature and the physical environment the environment around we people and once when i was reading george orwell one of the of course very noted writers and a very insightful and a very precocious political thinker i came across that he is deep rooted in this kind of issue well before the concept of eco criticism was put in practice because this eco criticism this kind of uh, theoretical base was discussed uh, around in 1970s and uh, george orwell composed the fiction upcoming for air 
1939. And so I wanted to, of course, talk uh, in relation to uh, Orwell because he wants to ultimately reinstate the system. His anger is related to the system. The foremost problem embedded in his novels is alarmed with the modern sociopolitical economic problems and positions. And he undertakes these issues to express the people without certain ideologies. He considers that novel is one of the commanding means of keeping people conscious of the socio-economic, political, and ecological problems. Ecocriticism that way is also known as environmental criticism, or as recently stated, green studies, where scholarly, uh, where the scholars study literary texts through an ecocritical lens that illustrates environmental concerns and uh, naturally inspects the various ways literature treats the subjects of nature from an interdisciplinary point of view. Of course, Ecocriticism, this concept is not uh, concrete. To some extent, I say not concrete uh, because uh, till now we have been, or many scholars have been trying to, of course, concretize it, but it is not yet concretized. And so, ecocriticism is not concrete, it is not the weakness of the concept. It is the wealth of the concept because when it is difficult to concretize this concept, naturally it became interdisciplinary and it has been encompassing a number of facets and fields of its study. Hereby, few scholars have put forward a step towards understanding of the concept and its application to literary texts. And in a sense, several scholarly definitions have been scrutinized so far as per their application of the ecocritical approach to literary text writings. But still, there is not any exact established structure. Peter Barry states the ambivalent and uh, indefinite, uh, of course, state of uh, ecocriticism and its application. However, Dr. Atmaram, yeah. can you hear me? Yes. Uh, a, yes. A request. A request. A principal has joined us. She wants to give a presidential address and she wants to. Be okay, sure. okay. Uh, she uh, is welcomed and I request her to see yes. uh, to proceed. She okay. wants to join us. So, so sure. yeah, okay, okay, okay. Welcome, welcome. Uh, yes. And principal, ma'am, are you here, yeah, ma'am? Yeah. Ah, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, sir, welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. A learner always begins by asking questions and finding fault, but the scholar finds the positive. Samati? Sumati? Sumati? Ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, ma'am. not audible. Yeah, I, 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 yeah I'm inviting our principal, ma'am. Wait, ma'am, please, ma'am. Yes, uh, uh, you're audible, <laughs> madam. You're audible. Yes, yes. May I invite our principal? Uh, Miss, we have such a wonderful, great scholar, our educationist, our beloved dear, dear principal, ma'am, Dr. V. Anuradha, principal of our college. She is a very positive and uh, um, optimist, seeing everything, and uh, very most powerful, powerful men in our college. And uh, she happens to see uh, weapons like a smile, perseverance, and a kind words to bring out changes in every activity to promote the status of the college, to strengthen the quality of learning and teaching pedagogy. May I invite uh, such a determined, beloved dear principal, Ma Dr. B. Anuradha, to tell you our president, she met us. Ma'am, please, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, one and all. Hope you all are uh, doing well. I am very much uh, privileged to preside over this uh, national webinar series. Um, 
and uh, on behalf of our uh, mvm family i am very much happy to welcome our uh, chief guest our uh, uh, an eminent scholar uh, dr atmaram professor uh, and the head department of english and research center uh, parbani maharashtra uh, sir welcome you sir thank you thank you in this occasion i would like to uh, appreciate Dr. Angelin, HOD of English, uh, uh, Dr. K. M. Sumati, uh, Assistant Professor in English, and all the staff members of our English department for organizing this uh, wonderful uh, national uh, webinar series and wish the webinar uh, to a successful one. Uh, dear students, thank you, madam. All the best. Uh, thank you, one and all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for your presidential address, ma'am. May I invite Atma Ram sir to proceed, sir? Could you please continue, sir? Yes, yes. Thank you, madam. Yes, uh, ah, please, uh, please, sir. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was, uh, of course, uh, talking. I was uh, at the place. Uh, the eco-criticism is not uh, concrete in itself. I was talking uh, that... Uh, so far as for the application of the eco-critical perspective to literary writings, uh, still there is not, uh, I was saying, that an exact established structure of eco-criticism. And I was referring, Peter Barry states the uh, ambivalent and uh, a kind of uh, indefinite state of eco-criticism and its application. However, unlike most of the theories discussed in uh, Peter Barry's book, it is still distinctly on the academic margins. The book is the first of the many available general readers and introductions to literary theory to mention eco-criticism and the movement still does not have a widely known set of assumptions. The concept has not widely known set of doctrines or procedures. Besides, eco-criticism being widely confined to the theoretically discredited parameters of literary realism finds itself fighting with hermeneutical closure and facing an ambivalent openness in its interpretive approach. When George Orwell composed uh, coming up for air, it is composed between, during the war periods. And of course, it was a period of transition. World War the First and World War the Second. Coming up for air portrays structural transformations in society. It's political, economic, cultural, Consequently, ecological transformations. There are a number of disappointing historical, political, and uh, ecological influences on the society uh, of the First World War. There was despair and disappointment and lack of expectation. Man, after the First World War, completely detached from the world of nature and was succumbing to the rise of industrial life. The industrial life led man to the state of pointlessness and dislocated his identity. In a sense, his mechanical style was governed by material values and norms. In Upcoming for Air, it is very true that uh, the protagonist, George Bowling, his plan is to run away from hubbub crowd in city for a visit to his native Lower Binfield. This is uh, his native place and uh, it is uh, uh, just seven kilometers away from the Thames River. I had the opportunity to go to London when I was invited by the Burke Bake University, London. I had visited, of course, this place and many other places also. 
This place is, uh, of course, uh, located in a very beautiful area, George, in the section first of the fiction, hopes and decides to visit Lower Binfield. And actually, he spends a long section, third, where he visits and recounts his youth in a nostalgic manner. This section provides full scope to Orwell to see the British society closely. Bowling is an all-pervading English man. He sarcastically comments on the British society with Bowling and his wife, Hilda. Bowling is dissatisfied to discover the countryside completely transformed. Because long back in his childhood, the lower Binfield he had enjoyed and the present situation, there are, there are drastic transformations. Finding little that he remembers and no one even recognizes him. Of course, it is, again, loss of identity. In addition, the lower Binfield, the native place of the writer, has become a factory town, making war weapons for upcoming war as well as training camp for British pilots. One of them, unintentionally, drops a bomb during a training operation. And uh, uh, this, of course, uh, damages uh, a number of natural things uh, with the explosion of the bomb. The writer remembers in this section the decay of nature, and he remembers that he remembers different seasons because all his memories are bound up with things to eat. All his memories are bound with varied places of the native place, especially the things he used to find in the hedges. In June and July, dewberries, but they were very rare and the blackberries were getting red enough to eat. In September, there were sloes and hazelnuts. The best hazelnuts were always out of reach. Later on, there were beech nuts and crab apples. Then there were the kind of minor foods that he used to eat when there was nothing better going. Hogs, but they aren't not much good and hips, which have a nice, sharp test if you clean the hairs out of them. Angelica is good in early summer, especially when he was thirsty and so are the stems of various grasses. Then there was sorrel, which is good with bread and butter and pig nuts and a kind of wood samrock, which has a sour taste. Even plantain seeds are better than nothing when he is a long way from home and very hungry. He recollects all these things, but he comes across that he has lost all these things in the passage of time. Now, Lower Binfield, a village with 2,000 inhabitants. It was in Oxfordshire, seven miles away from the Thames. It was in a valley with ripples of hills between the village and the Thames. On the top of the hills, there were woods in deep blue masses. Of course, he recollects all the scenes and sights, even the robbed birds' nests and ate ghost berries and raspberries, bed of dead leaves, shouting to hear echo and enjoyed in the crystal clear streams. But now, when he visits this place, he finds that he has lost everything. He finds that the fishing of his typical civilization is gone forever. The idea of sitting under a willow tree beside a quiet pool has disappeared because technology and industrial revolution reinforce the, the alternation of the rural lifestyle with urban lifestyle. The novel gives not only political and historical examinations, but also conveys the problem of environmental pollution as the most complex social and cultural and economic issues, which threatens the societal and economic conditions. 
with its widespread highlighting on the investigation of the key ecological problems like deforestation, contamination of rivers, and chemical poisoning of the rivers, the writer recollects this transformation after industrialization. And he feels, if the people now go for fishing nowadays, he wonders. And anywhere within 100 miles of London, there were no fish left to catch. A few dismal fishes, fishing clubs, plant themselves in rows along the banks of canals, and millineries go trout fishing in private waters around Scottish hotels, a snort of snobbish game of catching hand-reared fish with artificial flies. But who fishes in mill streams or moats or cow ponds any longer? No, all this has been, of course, destroyed in the process of modernization and in the process of industrialization. The writer elaborates at length how Sarazin's technological advances have destroyed, of course, the nature in the course of time. Everything is made out of a factory. The dog biscuits of all shapes and colors, medicines, embrocations and conditioning powders branched off into such things as rat traps, dog chains, incubators, sanitary eggs, bird netting, bulbs, weed killer, insecticide, and all so many things are there. The novel especially points out the outrageous consequences of technology, which have invited the devastation of natural environment and unavoidable total destruction of human being. No doubt, the anthropocentric uh, contemplation uh, which is a human-centered approach with a face of human well-being is visible in upcoming for air. During the span of 20 years, favorite natural and cow-like animals disappeared from the native land, Lower Benfield. As a narrator, he reached his native. The first question was where Lower Benfield was. He did not mean that it had been demolished. It had simply been swallowed up by the industrialization and deforestation. He tries to identify his original Binfield, but it is not found anywhere. Though man is anthropocentric, ecocentrism inspects the planet as an organic system, functioning through the interaction and uh, correlation of its gears. Anthropocentrism, on one hand, differentiates mankind from the rest of the living things, and on the other hand, contradicts the fact that other species also have the same right to exist, survive, and exhibit, and thus validates the human act about mistreatment of nature. In this connection, eco-criticism, Endeavors to settle on completely a new scientific view of nature. Under this light of eco-critical perspective, coming up for air can be well thought out as a noteworthy novel in its scientific view of nature as a source of life. And so the protagonist repents for the loss and disappearance of farming. George Bowling, the protagonist of the fiction. Bowling's spiritual acquaintance with nature is very, very prominent in the fiction, which he cherished from his childhood. But it is now placed in proximity with the anthropocentric view of the modern society in which Bowling is witness. He beholds houses, shops, cinemas, chapels, football grounds, all new. Again, he had that feeling of a kind of enemy invasion having happened behind his back. All these people floating in from Lancashire and the London suburbs 
planting themselves down in this beastly chaos, not even bothering to know the landmarks of the town by name. The modern society's view is anthropocentric as it is largely promoting human ends by exploiting nature. Anthropocentrism holds the outlook that humans alone are the superior being at the center of the universe. And all other continue to exist, exist for instrumental purpose. And they have no intrinsic value. And so they are not worthy for any kind of moral status. In this approach, man's relation with the non-human world is only in terms of his convenience. Bowling observes that nature is really treated as a commodity in consumer market. Bowling's hate of capitalism deserves from this approach of the modern society. And so he feels intensely to end industrial capitalism for it destroys nature completely. Bowling's attachment, the protagonist's attachment with the natural life of the planet remains fixed. On the contrary, materialistic approach takes to pieces the structure of the natural ecosystems. Norwegian eco-philosopher Arne Ness demands the need to change governmental policies. He suggests that the policies must therefore be changed. These policies affect basic economic, technological, and ideological structures. The resulting state of affairs will be deeply different from the present. The ideological change is mainly that of appreciating life quality rather than adhering to an increasingly higher standard of living. There will be a profound awareness of the difference between bigness and greatness. From the ecocritical point of view, the protagonist of coming up for air throughout the novel is dissatisfied with his life in town and his personality is fragmented due to the loss of connection with the natural environment at his native dwelling place. The thought of nature in native place facilitates him to find out the true meaning of his existence. Without it, he seems to be disappeared in an urban chaos. For example, he recollects how fishing used to be an essential part of his daily life, a spontaneous activity, which inher inherently connects him to the natural scenes and sights. He belonged to it. He explains the dichotomy between countryside and urban life. Of course, it is a very fact in the fiction that uh, George Orwell had never caught a fish, but he is very much, of course, uh, involved in and engrossed in fishing. He's very much interested in fishing and he had spent his time and hours and days and weeks and months in fishing, though he had never caught any fish because he liked to be in the company of nature. And therefore he has of course, a very strong passion for fishing. And so he's very much worried about fishing. Where is the fishing in this modern and technological world or this industrial civilization has destroyed his happiness of fishing. That is the, that is the point. So George Bowling identifies the value of nature in his life in all complexities and in all critical situations. He finds that nature is the only solution and hence he craves to go back to lower field to live in harmony with nature. The construction of the novel is twofold. One fold is veiled and really it is a utopian picture. lures the writer to go back to his native place. Orwell distinguishes the intrinsic value of nature and illustrates an important ecological consciousness by investigating the problem of the extinction of species and pollution of rivers 
by chemicals and roving boats that used to be dirty choppy water he watched the floats rocking up and down among the ice cream tubs and the paper bags he gives guarantee that the thames is the thames river is not so clear as it was in the past the chemical mixed in the river water creates a great damage to the ecosystem which is one of the principal concerns of the ecologists rachel carlson has also stated that the most alarming of all man's assaults upon the environment is the contamination contamination of rivers and seas with dangerous and even lethal materials in this way now universal contamination of the environment chemicals are the sinister and little recognized patterns of the radiation in changing the very nature of the world the very nature of its life the beautiful and fairy like picture of nature in the memory of the protagonist of upcoming for air has vanished under the bulldozing effect of modernity hammered in the furnace of technological skill of man he thought that he was finished with that notion of going back to native place his hopes for future dwindle and so he asks himself what is the good of trying to visit the native place if nothing exists there in the novel shrinking of natural resources pollution chemical poisoning the menace of consumerism extinction of species are revealed as the complex problems in the reflexive modernity reflexive modernity i mean a number of things in the modernity are this way or that way related to the degradation of nature so i call it a reflexive modernity in addition to the problems the novel also endorses another alarming ecological problem widely recited as deforestation deforestation this is a kind of endorsement somewhere suppose the rivers get flooded and the water comes out of the river and of course it enters the villages and a number of lives are destroyed and damaged it is a kind of endorsement but if we don't understand this endorsement of the nature no kind of change is adopted by the people so this protagonist's personal pursuit to see the previous native place brings forth the, the decision of nature desertion of the nature from the life of lower field his personal disappointment becomes the social concern and so he requires instant amendment of rules and regulations uh, so that he can update of course the nature eco criticism has the solution to the environmental crisis no doubt his approach has been to establish a kind of equilibrium for the sustenance and the maintenance of reciprocal nature eco criticism campaigns the consumption of natural resources without depriving share of the coming generation the policy of renovating all the west material into eco friendly materials for the sustainable development deadly needed therefore generating the worldwide awareness of the apocalypse is essential in a sense the novel coming up for air by orwell earnestly persuades the people by way of raising dichotomy between rural and uh, urban lifestyles for the sustainable exploitation of natural resources the novel uh, that way deciphers between the limited uh, uh, production and uh, optimum consumption in rural life and the limitless production and the reckless consumption in urban life so george orwell the protagonist distinguishes the modern humanities dispensia excessia over dependence on uh, nature so these things of course uh, appealed to me a lot in george orwell starhawk is 
equally an important writer and the most important thing about Starok I like is that generally the texts are or many times are imaginative but Starhawk worked for 50 years. She tried to reconstruct the villages with greeneries. She collect, uh, collected the plants from different fields. She made even the corner of the road green. All the villages were reformed with the greenery for 50 years. And then she started reflecting her experience in the form of novel. So she is an uh, activist first and then writer. She acted first and then she preached. So she tries to keep balance between, of course, uh, first acting and then preaching according to what has been earlier practice. So uh, Starhawk is uh, that way, exposes the implications of uh, implications required for transforming every human being to make him not only intimate with nature, but active also to take action. And that's why I appreciate uh, Starhawk uh, for making a very practical effort to safeguard the living systems, for these systems ultimately sustain our life, our human life. She stalwartly and very carefully trusted the the watered ecological activism and inculcated the philosophy to bring it into reality. However, it is or it can be accomplished only by inculcating central religious values and a sense of self-sacrifice. Basically, her activism is intensely embedded in an anti-war philosophy to protect all living beings. She has, uh, of course, uh, composed uh, a very beautiful, uh, very, very short novella that is The Last Witch, which concentrates the natural behavior of the non-human world, where the plants, birds, animals, especially the fish in streams, survive naturally. Thus, this novel inculcates the perspective of biocentrism, ecocentrism, and cosmocentrism. And thus the world of wild which is away from anthropocentrism and uh, ecocide. In her fifth sacred thing and the last wild witch, Starhawk has uh, practical steps against ecocide and anthropocentrism. And she, of course, uh, very decisively transformed the villages into the green biocentric places. Though both the novel, through both the novels, she spiritually cultivates a kind of uh, vocation for natural expression about wilderness, not by law, but by conditioning mindsets to preserve what is existing and promoting people to understand what is needed for the survival of species, biodiversity and historical genetic characteristics of wildlife. In a sense, the children in that fiction act directly uh, for the futility of uh, uh, society's vices, and they try to develop harmonious relationship with nature. Ecoactivism is both political and ethical movement, and its aim is to improve the quality of natural environment by initiating change in activities that are harmful to the environment. The devastated state of environment and the dire necessity to control the extinction of species and the need of healthy environment have been the major sensitive and true standpoints of Starhawk's presentation or deliberations. The seer and authentic view of a dystopian world was brought to the notice of world for environmental preservation. It had been the prime vocation of Maya in walking to Mercury, the realistic practices of worshiping, the ritualistic mode of worshiping nature and bringing harmony were depicted as major forces in the life of Earth. Of course, the protection of Mother Earth, Mother Earth is the crux to the 
eco-feminist paraxis. A fundamental thematic apprehension of walking to Mercury is the carnival of womanhood and motherhood by equating the intrinsic notions in terms of the instinct of creation and regeneration like the earth. To an extent, all the novels referred here by Starhawk widely focused on transformative events. But the changes Starhawk has brought in reality are all projectable. Strictly speaking, her novels are the narratives of the ecological regeneration. The ecologically incomparable and legendary creation, the fifth sacred thing composed in 1993, is a post-apocalyptic fiction by Starhawk. The title denotes uh, the classical elements of uh, fire, earth, air, and water, as well as the fifth element is also there, that is spirit. Accessible when one has to take a wage in scale to bring equilibrium with the other four elements. Basically, the fifth sacred thing is structured as a post apocalyptic fiction set in 2048 in California. It seems that Starock is one of the defensive environmentalists who defends each individual's immediate environment. And so the generous characters of the innovative fiction resided in the city of San Francisco where society was an unrestricted community, breathing a comfortable life in harmony with the four sacred things that stand required in life. Modernization is a mixed blessing or disguised blessing because it bestowed technological prosperity on one hand, but on the other hand, exploited and destroyed the natural resources recklessly. Nevertheless, Starhawk has fought the battle against the visible and invisible overuse of natural resources. The significance of the soil, water and air as the gifts of forest has been articulated by women even in Chipko moment in India also. Moreover, in the fifth sacred thing, an invading gathering from the north, the city of San Francisco sacrificed their lives to seal the reactor in slot own and Irish hills. On realization, to resuffle the energy crisis, women and other burdened individuals join hands to steer a campaign against the loss of the environment by inventing remedies in the form of application of non-conservational energy sources like solar and wind power. Uh, of course, uh, besides the uh, these things, the fifth sacred thing is uh, the natural Bible, prominently juxtaposed uh, the eco-feminist concerns of forestation and tree plantation on one side and a deforestation on the other side relating to soil, the earth, air, water, uh, and its conservation. It has also highlighted air and its contaminations, including ozone cell depletion, vigilant utilization of non-renewable energy, and substitutes in the form of non-conventional energy sources related to fire and use of herbal homeopathic medicines instead of allopathic. The fiction, the sacred thing that way by Starhawk uh, nurtured campaign initiated and battled against annihilating ecological crisis through eco-feminist reflections by women prominently, because of course, uh, this is a very prominent issue in uh, this novel because this novel strongly believes that men have uh, now failed to protect the earth. And so who will now protect the universe, protect the earth? Women, because since uh, it is their inborn instinct to care, 
So caring is the quality, okay, uh, with the women. And so she believes that they will protect the earth. That is a very big issue in this fiction. And so the novelist Starhawk promoted her characters, Maya, Mandrone, and Bird, to dedicate for healing resources at the same time to preach and practice non-violence and harmony. In the end, she motivated to overhaul about the people and the earth, considering the eco-feminist apprehensions comprehensively. Maya is Starhawk's uh, foremost central character to create life-threatening cognizance, supported by accomplishment among the women folk by way of perversion to persuade the people to protect nature. And that's why they undertook uh, the task of uh, planting trees, flourishing greenery of the San Francisco valleys. They even undertook the accountability of uh, cultivating and growing trees for life. The author recalls the effort through the uh, number of, of course, uh, conversations like, do trees grow where you come from? Everywhere they try to concentrate on the trees, trees and growing of the trees. They plant the trees and that's why they have trees and that's they have, of course, fruits and the fruits are free to all and all can eat the fruits because they belong to all. Such kind of, of course, approach is there uh, so that the people can be perverted, people can be promoted to cultivate the trees and make the nature not only beautiful, but fruitful for the coming generations also. So she has even undertaken the uh, rejuvenation of water also. She talks about uh, uh, water a lot in the fiction, the purification of the water. And then uh, in this way, and she believes that nature has an intrinsic value which humans ought to acknowledge. So here Maya and the rest of the characters delegated to the assignment of shielding natural resources by way of preserving water as a substantial grassroots work to avoid the war for water in coming days. In a sense, the San Francisco people galvanized the conversation of conserving water in reservoirs so as to reprocess it. Okay, the water is again reprocessed and utilized again and again. And the importance of water is, of course, uh, shown to the people. Besides the industries violate the rules and pollute a lot of water in the world, ignoring the expectation of safe drinking water. Moreover, the release of uh, chemicals uh, in the water reservoirs eventually become a threat for the numerous life forms. It damaged the bi biodiversity, especially uh, how it has been and uh, unbecoming for the industries. The conspicuous countries in this regard have been, unfortunately, India, Africa, uh, under-industrialized in and uh, developing countries. Moreover, industries exploited a large quantity of water in the globe overlooking the demand of a drinking water for over half of the citizens of the sphere. The culture of industrial development degenerated. A am I audible? Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, okay, okay, yes, okay. Because yes, in a flux, I, I may be flowing with the, of course, uh, flow of the lecture and uh, you may not be listening. That's why I asked. Uh, basically, the culture of industrial development uh, degenerated, of course, resources by subsiding the environmental consciousness. Uh, con uh, consciousness. Therefore, the management of uh, water resources at the hands of the stewards was not astonished in any sense to regulate nature and the women and thereby to retain the state power to rule over the world has been identified in the steward regime in this fiction. The sad circumstances uh, uh, was unidentified to the stewards. Nonetheless, the water ration card, that kind of issue is also very um, nice. It promotes the necessity of uh, using uh, water very calculatedly. 
water ration card was an approaching peril for humanity, of course, no doubt. It was destined to buy water by paying all the wealth available with the family. It is a frightening, of course, prophecy that the entire world population will lose life due to the scarcity of water. It even compels to remains water and uh, one will evoke the lines in Esti Kulrujas, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, where he sings, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. It is a lurking fear and sheer endorsement for human generation to, of course, get recovered from uh, a kind of uh, anthropocentric uh, concern and save this uh, biosphere in the um, grip of uh, man-made, of course, catastrophe. Though the water in the ocean is thought affordable, it is plenty of no doubt. It is difficult, if not impossible, to renovate it into consumable water. So in one of the articles uh, uh, I had written with uh, Sangeeta Auchar, and we had stated that uh, significantly uh, there is plenty of uh, water. The women characters conserve it carefully and uh, reuse it. Besides, they allow water to flow naturally and freely to maintain the rhythm in nature, which automatically preserves nature in many ways. As a part of this uh, conservation shows, uh, the showers are used and water ration cards are thought of to save water. The women in this moment save water to avoid the destruction of biodiversity as well as wars for water, unquote. Uh, Starhawk moved forward in the sacred things to annihilate the political, economic, and socio-cultural systems for not being proficient to recompense ozone lessening episode. Uh, this episode is that way, very, very big and uh, very uh, much stressed, of course, in the novel. The ozone layer adapts the hazardous ultraviolet radiations of the sun, which may generate life, threatening plights for the people on the globe. Such a disaster is the result of uh, reflexive modernization. It is the probable account of the dreadful consequences of the decline of ozone hole and if its effect on the entire humanity. The ozone depletion implications are represented in detail, okay, in the fiction. Its severe impact can be predicted with a quotation from an economist philosopher that the ozone layer over the United States was depleting 300% faster and that it would lead to 2 lakh more skin cancer deaths within the next 50 years. Ozone depletion and the ozone opening have become worldwide concern over bigger cancer risks and erstwhile pessimistic special effects. The ozone layer prevents the most uh, useful, of course, uh, things that uh, make one cautious about harmful wavelengths of ultraviolet light from passing through the Earth's environment. These wavelengths are the derivations of the origin of skin cancer in this line. Therefore, the, this prophecy demands to introspect ecologically and uh, bring eco-friendly transformations in the lifestyles to minimize uh, the intensity and uh, sphere of ozone layer. Once it is confirmed that the manufacturing of uh, chlorofluorocarbon is the foremost Traitor in decreasing the ozone layer, a stern apprise to check and terminate the production of chlorofluorocarbon needs to be instantaneously adapted as the policy by the farmers, not only of the United States, but also of the whole world. The truth is that USA is one of the three major carbon dioxide emitting countries of the world, the other two being USSR and China. The world's countries emit 
greatly diverse amounts of health generating gases into the environment. I have, of course, a diagram that shows country-wise uh, emission of uh, carbon dioxide, but it was long bet stated by Rachel Carson around 1962 to stop the use of carbon. But in the course of time, uh, it has increased and it has become, of course, uh, a danger. The ozone depletion has been a, created a serious and nature endorsement if the people understand it. Okay, actually one should take action to transform the climate as an immediate answer to the endorsement. However, there is unlikelihood of the diminution of ozone depletion. It is high time for humanity, no doubt, to introspect by manipulating an effective blueprint for the protection of coming generations. In a sense, and the fifth sacred thing not only gave out a space for the obvious catastrophe of ozone depletion and the political contacts to be operated by the United States and the worldly agencies, but it proposed remedies and solutions of eco-symphonic lifestyle effectively amended by the uh, chief narrators, their relatives, friends, and uh, uh, of course, uh, social reformers also. Even the Wordsworth had also uh, talked about uh, this kind of uh, uh, modernization and uh, the danger to the universe. The world is too much with us. Uh, late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Okay, The poet is annoyed to see the damage to nature and so criticizes and gives a warning that he saw as the self-indulgent material pessimism of the time. It has disappointed him and devastated the nature. Okay, that is also in Wordsworth's uh, poetry. Uh, of course, uh, in the course of time, uh, the fifth sacred thing by Starhawk uh, suggests uh, to undertake organic farming. And even uh, she practiced um, herbal medicine in uh, San Francisco. This, she treated patients with uh, herbal, of course, uh, medicine and thus tried to be very close to uh, nature. And she provided, of course, uh, a message to conserve uh, nature. Okay. Uh, Ruskin Bond, similarly, is another writer, and uh, I do not know how much time is there. Okay, uh, madam, uh, may I know the time, or shall I continue? Yeah, continue, sir, continue, sir. 12.30, sir. How about you, sir? Uh, uh, it, it may take 20 minutes, but I will continue please. for 5 minutes, 10 minutes. Yeah, please, sir, please, sir. Please, sir, go ahead, sir. Please, okay, please, sir. okay, okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ruskin Bond is again uh, one of the, of course, uh, writers, most significant and ecologically developed, deep, uh, one of the developed deep Indian writers. He has profound insight into environmental concerns and uh, vibrations of nature, as well as wisdom and teaching is there, of course. Uh, he talks about uh, if uh, uh, any student or a teacher for the first time reads Ruskin Bond. Uh, there are very simple, of course, uh, uh, descriptions of the place and river and mountains and trees and all these things. Okay, But the place has a powerful influence in conditioning identity, ideology, thought processes, and the development of a sense of belongingness that is experienced in uh, Ruskin Bond's fiction. The place has a number of connotations also, such as site, local, region, town, city, area, country. In uh, cultural geography also, the place is more than an area. Physical surroundings, a point or position in a social scale, and a point of departure in space. Place as a verb means to identify by connecting with some associated context to establish a connection for something. Scholars and uh, critics deal with connotations of place. Everything which exists has to be present somewhere. The place in his 
scrutiny is a necessary starting point from which it is possible to understand both space and moment and change also. In conclusion, meaning and identity are linked to place by Ruskin bond. The place builds a sense of meaning, identity, belongingness, and attachment. A stone gets identity due to its place. A city person may have an unconstructive experience of the city and may wish to return to countryside nature to have a positive experience. The identical may be the case with a village person who has spent his childhood years in an urban environment may feel most fully connected to themselves when they are surrounded by street noise. But a rustic, he has a very keen attachment with a rural setting. He may have a rural setting or it may desire a natural environment where they feel most comfortable. The rural characters are unaccustomed with the urban life and they have still affinity with nature. Okay, substantially speaking, man is an integral element of nature not a distant from nature, but his capability to renovate and restructure nature has excluded him from the pure nature. Therefore, his abilities and capacities are scrutinized in the context of culture. Man through a systematic cultural practice went on achieving new heights of his prosperity and slowly and steadily destroyed nature without knowing it for a long time. And so Bond's short stories is a waking alarm for establishing an amicable relationship between nature and culture. He has affinity. His stories are predictable, perceptible in presenting a sense of place, impact, intimacy, and place attachment. His characters are everlastingly developed valued deep in native place. Physical environment is part of their life. A lime in tree in the hills is a short story by him, which uh, delineates the entire picture of uh, nature and a very healthy atmosphere uh, for the family. Okay, His friend comes to the village Manjiri, clinging to the terraced slopes of uh, very proud mountains. And he, wake, he was waked by the throaty chuckles of the red-billed blue magpies. But today, Cicada has uh, drawn all bird song and his friends milking family buffaloes and uh, mother lighting fire and the handsome, uh, of course, the atmosphere weighed down by heavy silver, uh, of course, uh, streams and all these things are uh, there. All these characters are separated from the setting. They revealed no significant implication, but for bond. He instituted a firm bond between nature and the humans. Life in the midst of nature. And weaved a disposition of geographical, social, and cultural association. Bond's countless stories throw light on the livelihood and the economic situation of the people in hilly areas. In many stories, children are forced by the condition to work to support their families. Basically, Gadwal people were poor farmers who lived in distant villages. The only source of livelihood in hills was farming, but rocky soils and snowy winter like uh, ecological obstacles were big complexities in harvesting. Due to the scarcity of fertile land, people had to depend on the other sources of income, they had to go down to the plains to search job uh, as a cooks and bearers. They used to take benefits of ordinary land and forests, but many environmental and developmental missions had brought a decline in sources of earning. Bond composes in from small beginnings. There is no money to be earned in the villages, and money is needed for clothes, soaps, medicines, and recovering the family jewelry from the money lenders. So the young men leave their villages to find work, and to find work, they must go to the plains. The lucky ones get into the army. 
So there is this kind of uh, impact on the uh, economic conditions due to the decline of nature. There is still a small number of nomadic tribes in the Himalayan regions who used to shift in the winter to the lower Himalayas. But in summer time, they again go back to the upper mountains for earning livestock. They majorly depend on forest and nature. But under the name of development, what happened in the course of time? There is a contemporary, contemporary materialistic civilization that makes man the butcher of the planet. And so uh, in long walk for Bina, uh, the school children talk about the uh, dam and its effect and so on, how the electric power and water for irrigation will be provided. But the rest of the children are worried and confused about the dislocation of people and damage of habitats of animals. Because all these things are going to raise the ecosystem of the vicinity and would dislocate and destroy organic systems. So that is also reflected by, uh, of course, uh, Ruskin Bond. Ruskin Bond, so, uh, of course, children in different stories, they have attachment. They live with the trees. They think that the trees are watching them and they have very much affinity with the trees because the trees stand watching over day-to-day uh, -day life. They are the guardians of their conscience. And so the writer says, I do what I think they would approve the most. The trees watch over me as I write. When I look up, they remind me that they are there. And that's why I go on writing. So there is, of course, uh, this kind of uh, uh, environment is there. Uh, this kind of attachment uh, with nature is there. The relationship of the humans with animals is very, of course, complex. Um, this kind of complexity is also revealed by uh, Ruskin Bond in his uh, stories. And he has even interpreted the relationship between plant and person because plants are self-regulating beings gifted with nourishing themselves without any external human hold. However, animals are, humans are completely reliant on nature. More or plants, the source of energy, execute several functions in human civilization. Art, literature, culture, religion, philosophy, mythology, food habits, and clothing are all largely influenced by the plants in a bioregion. But the impact of plants on the identity, meaning, and culture of humans cannot be ignored. In a hierarchical order of being, the plants are considered at the lowest place but they are placed after animals. Actually, plants should be in upper category. In hierarchical order, they must be above even man and animals because man and animals, again, depend on plants. And so the plants must be uh, in, uh, above, uh, in upper stage as far as uh, this uh, human hierarchy is concerned or living organisms hierarchies and concerned. This is also, of course, uh, uh, reflected by Ruskin Bond. According to the botanists, the plants are excessively sophisticated and capable of autonomous extension processes. Plants are creators of food with the help of sunlight. They have supplementary capacity to nourish themselves and thus they are self-reliant on the contrary, animals and humans are mostly depending on plants. In the face of living status, they are not thought to have intelligence and sense of perception. However, the investigation in the promising field of plant neurobiology reveals that the plants have various intelligence and sensory abilities. In this context, Hall puts forward the notion that plants have sophisticated De decentralized neurosensory systems uh, that uh, even uh, Ruskin Bond takes uh, cognizance of these uh, uh, sensory systems of the plants and uh, shows that how the plants are above uh, the animals and human beings. As the botanists indicate, Bond is also of the opinion that the plants are living sentient and intellectual life forms. In Death of the Trees uh, is a short story by Bond, 
which considers trees and persons and so subject to die. There is no concept of the slaughter of plants in our socio-cultural fabrication. Bond brings forth the concept of slaughter and killing of plants. And so we understand the sensitivity of the writer towards the plants. He contrasts the killing of trees with the killing of humans to place the plants in human and animal category. Uh, that is, of course, there in his uh, writings. Then there are references to Ayurvedas and how the, the marriage ritual with the Mawa forest trees typical in the Gond, uh, of course, uh, families bond shows in great spirits of the trees like uh, short stories. So plants and human culture are so deeply interwoven that the discipline of plant studies fundamentally coextensive with human studies. So these three writers are, of course, uh, uh, very, of course, uh, crucial in their perception of the nature and the uh, world around them. So I just tried to understand the, the what you call, uh, standpoints and power structures of these writers. Ruskin bond has his native place as a power structure because that is naturally well built. And when this is disturbed, his power structure is disturbed. At the same time, in Starhawk, the dedication for upliftment by way of cultivating the trees is a very crucial point because her every activity is concerned with the enrichment of nature. And that is the power structure because he is concerned with building and constructing. What is built, the nature is built. What is constructed, the nature is constructed. And in, uh, of course, risk in a bond, of course, he lives, of course, in the company of nature. He's always surrounded by nature and he has affinity with even the blade of the grass also. So such kind of uh, attachment with or practical attachment with the nature is very much required. With these words, um, I thank the organizers for uh, inviting me, giving me this platform to uh, unfold, of course, my views before you. Thank you very much for giving this kind of opportunity to me. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It, it was a very, really excellent lecture, sir. Uh, thank you so much for your very informative, interesting, and impressive. Okay, welcome. Sir, excellent, sir. Excellent Hi. lecture, sir. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Really, very excellent. Okay, thank you very uh, much. Can you hear me, all of you? Uh, yes, if you have any, of course, uh, queries or if you want uh, uh, me to answer your yeah, question, so please. Was, uh, very informative, interesting, and impressive. So very, very impressive on eco criticism. Oh, okay. And, uh, uh, thank you. It was, uh, beyond the expectations, sir. Uh, you have oh, okay, opened okay, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. I request uh, any professors to give their reviews, opinions, or comments over the lecture. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, we even, uh, uh, we are thinking of uh, Spencer's uh, prothalamine and epithalamine uh, in the descriptions of ecological uh, theories. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. This is Ms. Hemalata. Are you okay? Uh, that is, your lecture is full of uh, information, interesting views, interesting concepts, really impressive. Yeah. We, uh, we are really uh, grateful to you, sir. 
the thing is okay. uh, your lecture actually reminded me of wordsworth what man yeah. has ma made of man yeah okay okay uh, lines written in early spring i think so uh, apart from that any poetic uh, any poem like uh, any writer like stephen gill yeah could you please uh, just uh, explain us uh, what explain what is to be explained uh, yes sir it's concept really well explained yes sir uh, so what is to be explained that is uh, uh, regarding that is uh, you have uh, talked about three writers apart yeah. uh, i could see some uh, uh, resemblance resemblance yeah. with stephen gill also uh, am uh, i correct sir okay so in stephen gill also because i have not read the texts of that writer but there are many writers okay those okay. who are uh, writing about uh, ecological concerns okay uh, but uh, um, there is not a big number okay we have rare writers those who are writing on nature especially ruskin bond is there in regional languages there are a few writers okay we have um, in uh, maharashtra in marathi maruti chitampalli is there he writes about uh, ecological concerns rest of the writers are there but uh, they are not so dived deep uh, as these three writers are okay uh, i have not uh, come across uh, uh, other than ruskin bond other writer is not so keen about uh, natural elements okay as far as their presentations are concerned because in ruskin bond or in uh, starhawk or in uh, orwell i see that that kind of uh, sense of uh, what you call a damage to nature is so prominent that they feel of course wounded as they are writing about uh, the elements in nature and uh, when they express their views in the context of uh, preservation of nature and the effects of uh, modernization on the entire nature so this kind of uh, what you call dichotomy is uh, well reflected in these writers okay Uh, in the course of time i will go through if there is uh, any possibility to study rest of the writers else okay but in india there are many regional writers those who are writing about uh, the ecological issues thank you sir thank you so much sir okay 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 uh, thank you you know ma'am thank you hemalata anybody Anybody Thank would you. like to share your views or opinions, please? An information to all of you. We have posted the link, feedback link. Kindly uh, give your feedback and also please get your certificates. Sir. Bala, are you here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, please, please yes. invite Enuma. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Showing gratitude is one of the simplest, yet most powerful things humans can do for each other. Yes, it's time to propose a vote of thanks. I take pleasure in inviting Dr. P. Inola Arucharvi Parvata, an eminent and efficient personality of our department, to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you, Bala. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone here. first of all i would like to acknowledge one thing here i feel proud to say this for the first time in the history of our college only the department of english has arranged for first virtual seminar series for 5 days so the department of english mb mudaya government arts college for dindigal deserves congratulations and wishes on behalf of the department of english and the organizing committee of this virtual seminar series first i would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to our most respected and beloved principal dr b anuradha for permitting us to convene this 
virtual uh, seminar series today. I thank Madam for her enthusiastic mm -hmm. support and uh, excellent guidance rendered to us to conduct this virtual seminar confidently. I'm immensely happy to thank Madam for her excellent presidential address. Thank you, Madam. I'm very much privileged to thank our guest speaker of today's a virtual seminar, Dr. Atmaram Gangane, for visiting and enlightening us with his fullest knowledge and wisdom in his busy schedule. Even though we have been in good terms with eco-criticism in literature, Dr. Atmaram Gangane's speech on eco-criticism with reference to George Arwell, Hart, and Ruskin Bond was really gave deep, uh, sorry, gave deep, deep insights into the topic. So uh, his speech, we got, through his speech, we got involved, revealed with certain interesting facts and new avenues of knowledge about eco-criticism that too with reference to the great literary persons. His session was really informative and knowledge seeking. I'm uh, pretty sure the precious knowledge that Dr. Atma Ram Gangane shared with us will definitely help the students and the scholars for their future studies. Thank you, sir. I extend my Thank thanks you. to Head of the thank you, sir. Head of the department, the convener of today's program, Dr. G. S. Angelin, for her valuable guidance and support to conduct this virtual seminar today. I'm happy in thanking her for her excellent and wonderful welcome address. Thank you, madam. Next, thank I you. would like to thank the organizing secretaries. Dr. P. Nola Rishili Parvada and Dr. K. M. Sumadi for their uh, good efforts to arrange this virtual seminar on eco criticism. My special thanks to our dear Dr. K. M. Sumadi for her meticulous efforts to arrange this virtual seminar. I'm happy to thank the organizing committee members of this virtual seminar, the regular faculty members and the guest lecturers of the English department for their timely help and great support. I'm deeply thankful to Ms. D. Sankida and Ms. Uh, Mrs. B. Balasaraswati, the senior guest lecturer for their lecturers for their technical support and help throughout the session. Finally, I thank uh, the staff and uh, students and scholars from various colleges and RDS students for their attentive listening to the lecture. Thank you, Unandor. Thank you. Thank you, dear ma'am, for your wonderful word of thanks. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, Dr. Atmaram, sir, we will be very grateful to you for your wonderful lecture, sir. We'll stay oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. You are always welcomed. Okay. Thank you for your appreciation. Thank you, sir. It's really very, very interesting and very impressive, sir. Very information. Thank okay. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Okay, welcome. We'll keep in touch with you in future also, sir, after pandemic. We'll okay, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Our, uh, um, master seminar, sir. Huh? Please stay connected okay. with us, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, dear friends. Thank you, dear friends. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. Thank you, Arul, for joining us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Smadi. Ma'am, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, all. Thank for you. For your wonderful vote of thanks, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Pasti mandiri saya. Terima kasih.